Now, government and health experts have made it clear that a large degree of how aggressively COVID-19 will spread from now on is based on our behavior as individuals. We're looking at ways we can limit transmission in communities tonight. To discuss, we're joined by the head of the Center for HIV and STI at the National Institute of Communicable Diseases, Professor Adrian Purin. Uh, Professor, thank you for being with us. Uh, the, the president, uh, the health minister, uh, they, they've spoken about how much individuals can make a difference. Some would say the president is right. An opposition party says no, he's, he's throwing the ball in our courts um, and, and really leaving, uh, washing his hands. Uh, but to what extent do you think wearing a mask, uh, sanitizing, practicing physical distancing, uh, what, how much difference does it really make? Yes, yeah, so I think these are critical questions. And you're right, it's it is really up to the individuals in the end, but I think it's really not just you're not on your own. I think it's obviously there's a great deal of government support in terms of its developing its policies, in terms of ensuring that we are able to try and prevent transmission as far as possible. Because that, those are the what are called the non-pharmaceutical interventions, such as the physical distancing, the hand hygiene, the wearing of masks, the cleaning of surfaces, and now with the aerosolization as well, ventilation certainly becomes important. I think all these particular aspects, it's both a government and a public interaction in order to, for us to try and prevent transmission. I think there's good evidence to show that those particular activities uh, certainly can certainly contribute to lessening trans transmission. Uh, the, the distance has been highlighted from the start. Now that there are full taxis, and, and we've accepted that, uh, with no distance uh, between those commuters, is, is the battle lost? No, I don't think it is lost. I, I think that we still need, as far as is possible, because it's not just those particular settings, it's settings at work, for example, um, it's settings at schools. These are all these sets of interactions that I think play a critical role in, in transmission. So you, you're right. So it becomes very difficult, if not impossible, in certain scenarios, as we've seen in our communities, to actually be able to actually implement those. But I think as far as it is feasible, I think we should certainly continue to do, do these particular activities to really try and stave off transmission as far as possible. So, so I know that for the majority of those individuals who, who do become infected, they will recover, and you've, you've mentioned that. But I think the concern is when you look at our hospital preparedness, it's really those individuals who end up in our high care ICUs, especially those who are of older age with particular comorbidities as well, such as diabetes, hypertension, and, and so on, those are the individuals that really are going to have poorer outcomes if we do not prevent transmission. So I think we really need to make those, those efforts as far as, as, as possible. Yeah, and, and we'll get to the hospitals, but I'm interested uh, if you have a comment on, on the schools. So the WHO, the World Health Organization, saying it might be better to wait till community transmission is, is low. We're heading towards the peak, uh, but, but the science is still mixed when it comes to children. I mean, is this a real test of, of leadership in South Africa right now? It, it is, I think, because I think there are multiple challenges um, with regard to it's not just about the children. I think the, the education of the children, I think, is undisputed. But I think it's the complexities around that. We've seen that, for example, there's now in Gauteng very high rates of community transmission. We know that t teachers and or others within that community are also affected because of, for example, age and comorbidities, for example. So it's really looking at those co particular complexities and coming up with a particular answer to do we really risk in terms of sending children to school, given that, for example, the teachers may not be available to, to carry out their particular function. So I think it's all those particular uh, factors in terms of preparedness that needs to be taken into account. Coming back to the taxi, so, so you're saying every effort counts. So, so wearing masks uh, can actually save lives. And, and a lot of talk of ventilation now, although that's hard, um, in, in the middle of a cold front for those commuters. Um, ventilation becoming more important because of the, the whole issue of it being airborne. How does that change our response? So, yeah, so in the, the taxi situation, I know it's very easy for us to say, you know, that you should open your windows in particular um, level in order for these particular smaller droplets to um, be moved along and outside of the taxi. But I think that that's going to be very difficult. 
So I think within those limitations, I think we need to look at, for example, and again, working with the taxi organizations to ensure that the taxes are cleaned and at, after each particular trip, for example, within the taxi in of itself, the individuals to try to check him or herself, for example, if there's access to sanitize, to use that, to wear masks, to face away from um, particular uh, uh, travelers, for example, um, and not to have conversations, no laughter, no loud sounds, because the, all of these particular factors certainly um, contribute. So when we're wearing masks, it's not foolproof, but it certainly does contribute, for example, to were you ill um, to be able to spread. But we do know that the asymptomatic spread is also a critical component to what we're seeing. So even though we have these absolute numbers of cases, it's far larger um, than we, we actually uh, know about. And so I think we still therefore have to make those particular efforts within that particular confined space. But of course, when you think of restaurants and, and so forth, or other confined spaces such as offices, for example, then again, I think there needs to be a focus on how to manage, uh, for example, ventilation, in, also to perhaps try and reduce the numbers of people within that particular office, uh, to try and ensure that there is at least some level of physical distancing. Yeah, very difficult to, uh, in buildings where there are no open windows. All right, so, so we've been focusing on hospitals Absolutely. tonight. Um, they are getting full. Uh, the health minister says there's still some capacity in Gauteng, though. Do we have a clearer picture now of the trade-offs that are being made as well? Um, uh, there's even been concerned that deaths from non-COVID diseases could go up. And I, I imagine you are concerned about HIV patients. Are you monitoring those patients um, and, and seeing uh, what sort of sacrifices we're, we're making, how are they faring? Yes, uh, the NICD together with provinces and the private sector are certainly now monitoring hospitals. Um, I know that I think all the private hospitals are under surveillance, as well as I think a fair proportion was starting to increase in the numbers of, of public health sector hospitals. So there is data coming through with regard to, for example, um, the use of and capacity of beds for, uh, as, as an important indicator, the use of the ICU facilities, as well as the use of oxygenation. So there is a monitoring system in place, does not cover um, all public hospitals. I think that that is the plan to do that. And that will give us a good sense um, in terms of how we are actually uh, progressing at, at this particular time. Thank you very much uh, for that tonight. The head of the Centre for HIV and STI at the National Institute of Communicable Diseases, Professor Adrian Purin.